Hi guys, Ashley here. Today I'm bringing you another phenomenal guest and this is Lu Gang, the founder and CEO of Technod.com, which is a media watching China technology. And Lu Gang is one of the most renowned experts on technology in China. Gang, it's phenomenal to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ashley. And it's my good pleasure you know, to be here and thanks for having me. Absolutely. Gang, we have so many topics to cover. I told you just before we began, I would like to um, speak about a variety of different subjects. So let's start with how has China arrived at a place in May 20 years where it's right now truly leading in a lot of uh, implementation of technology around the world, where it started, as many say, a copycat? How has it progressed into where it is right now? Yeah, I think, first of all, I think we have to be uh, realistic because I think in, in some part of, uh, you know, in the technology, I think, you know, China is taking the lead. But in some other part, I think, I think we are still catching up. Um, I think what happened, if you ask me the, the same question, probably five, maybe 10 years ago, you know, I would give the answer, you know, you know we, 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 are, we were not really confident to say we are leading somewhere. And instead, we're going to say, okay, probably... There are lots of copycats in China. If you look at it 10 years ago, I mean, it's a kind of a, kind of shame, I would say, is like we, we almost copy everything, you know, and, you know, it's from Silicon Valley, and you can always find the copy in China. And most interesting part is most of the copycats in China, they are super success, you know, successful in China, you know, Twitter, you know, Facebook, all this stuff, I mean, internet stuff. Um, is uh, you know we have the local version and and they did uh, very well in, in China, but I think what happened in the past maybe starting from like maybe early around like twenty I don't know twenty twelve twenty thirteen, I think you know basically I think the trigger of this is you know I think that if you look at the mobile internet you know the the three G four G I think around like the four G I think the China is kind of ahead of a uh, the, the global market you know we we are more or less i don't know the maybe number two or number three we are we we kind of fully adopt the 4g i think because of the 4g the infrastructure the really then plus we have like alibaba or tencent they, they build you know the alipay or wechat payment mm. and their infrastructure for for the kind of payment gateway so that build the infra infrastructure in the like, kind of soft layer your know, software layer the 4G is kind of the hard, you know, hardware layer, you know, layer. So we have both parts ready. So I think then we see we see more and more business model and an interesting kind of Chinese model to build on top of all these infrastructures. I think mm -hmm. that's how the, the, the whole Chinese Chinese internet market, you know, how you know took off. I think that's the probably that's the major reason we are kind of ahead of uh, um, the rest of the world. Uh, especially in the mobile market. So then we see, oh, then we see, and, and less than that people talk about the PC world, we all, everything is on mobile. Then we see, then we kind of skip the, you know, the credit card, that everything move to the cashless payment. Then because everything is on cashless, so we see like all the model, you know, the, the, all of a sudden we see, oh, actually everything we can charge on the mobile phone. That's, I, can, I think that easy, the kind of the, the loop of the, uh, uh, the what we call online to offline. So everything happens so naturally and you know, we can charge everything on mobile and then we, we start everything on mobile. So I think you see the, you know, basically we speed up and, and, and up and up. Then we start like, so right now we don't really, I think it's, it's we, we less and less we talk about copycats. Instead, you know, we copy, we, we're talking about and instead of copying you know, to China, we talk about copy from China, because if you go to Southeast Asia, especially, you instead, you, you can say, oh, we are doing something like China, you know, the Chinese knocking, or if mm. you think it's a good example, bad example, you know, the China version of Olama. So everything, we are looking at China now. So yeah, I think it's, um, yeah, it's a lot it's of definitely changes. definitely changed. Absolutely. Yeah. I totally agree with you. And I, I think another very important element here is the fact that, yes, there were those copycats, right? As you said, Twitter was copied, this and that, but it was always with local features, right? I, I think that those developers that actually started 
the app and started those services that were, they were always very connected with the market. What are people saying? How do I tweak it to make it my own, not just a copy of Twitter? And that's what uh, very rarely happens with copycats. Copycats don't know how to innovate for local market. They just keep doing what was done before. But for China, everything turned into a completely different animal. And on top of that, as you said, 2012, 13, you know, 4G network, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, what are you most excited about right now when it comes to technology? landscape in China? Is it the 5G? Is it the cybersecurity? Is this the uh, smart cities? Uh, is it the new retail? What are you watching closest right now in 2020? I think definitely it will be 5G. Uh, as, as I said, uh, you know, if we say you know, China, Chinese internet kind of technology part took off because the 4G is a more, almost 10 years ago. I think 5G bring us a lot of new and more opportunities uh, to the industries because you know, if you look at 5G, you know, we talk about like IoT, you know, internet of things, and you see maybe something will be changed again. And mm. I don't know, like mobile phone, the mobile applications, blah, blah. I think we're going to see some more ideas and we're going to see some new change. Um, but and instead, you know, beside the change, we're probably going to see something more, something really new. And... You know, because the IoT and because, you know, you don't know what happened to your watch, to, you know, like you know, the earphones, because imagine if everything's all connected, which is not connected right now, then you might, you, you might explore some new, new ideas, you know, maybe we, we don't know yet, but I think that's the most exciting part. And because the 5G is, it also connect the software, your software and the hardware, and imagine everything is connected, and so that'll be the new world. And and just to give an example, you know, we've been talking about like we you know VR or AR for, for years, but mm. we still on the consumer level, it's just for far. It's not really like we have really had a high demand. Mm. But five G, I, I don't know, maybe one day you, you don't need to go to the, the music concert or to the gym anymore. Maybe you can, you can really do something Maybe it's really it's time we can really talk about how we can mix the reality with the uh, you know virtual uh, realities. And um, I think that's uh, maybe you see something on the movie five years ago, but it's happening now. And. Um... I love it how you say, you know, IoT and everything is connected. The smart cities will be connected. The devices within individuals' home is going to be connected. The factories are going to be plugged into supply and demand, um, you know, chains, etc. cetera. Um, a lot of people, when they think about that connected world, they instantly get defensive. They instantly get scared because they believe that the smart machines or some governments or some, you know, uh, conspiracy theory uh, kind of uh, people ruling the world will come and start controlling us. Uh, uh, what is your take on uh, on this particular part? How do you see the future? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's really interesting and topic uh, question. I think it's I think it's uh, you know the no way we we can you know stop the how the technology kind of development. So it's uh, it's, it's like when we, when we started talking about five you know four G, I think that there are quite a few people they worry about like smartphone, right? Because we used to. Because I think that the 4G, we are, you know, we, we have iPhone or some of that new Android, and the people are afraid of that because of the, you know, the security, because the um, privacy or, you know, lots of, a lot of this. But right now, I think nobody going to say no to smartphone. And we all, mm. we all think that smartphone bring us lots of, um, and, you know, make our life much easier than before, you know, in some way. And so for 5Gs, you know, yeah, I think because the IoT means, you know, data, maybe a lot of people worry about the privacy because, mm. you know, it's not, it's 5G is not just for like you are a kind of mobile phone data, but because everything is connected, which means no matter where you are or what you're doing, your data might be personally will be exposed to the public. Mm. That's, mm. that's the major concern. I, th I think, I think that's um, something we should concern about that for sure. But Maybe at least to me is in, I'd rather you know look at the positive side, you know how mm. we can use this uh, smartly and to help the people, to help the the societies. Um, so I I think that's how you know how we see the technologies 
And do you see yeah, there's yeah. a fundamental difference between how in the West uh, users, we're talking about the user base, right? Uh, look at the data, uh, security and privacy and how they look in China. Because in China, uh, a lot of people just go into adoption right away. They go into the, you know, okay, let's just, there's a new app, let's upload it, let's accept and let's start using it. Let's bring the Xiaomi home and let it, you know, organize and um, manage my teapot and manage my curtains. And it's not a concern or it's less of a concern. So do you think there's a fundamental difference on the consumer level? Yeah, I, I think it's um, what it's, it's really hard to tell. Um, but I think it's really to do with um, maybe it's not the technology side, it's more like the philo philosophy side. It's, uh, how do people dealing with the, you know, how, how do you kind of define the kind of data privacy? I think maybe for Chinese is uh, we have more kind of soft version of the data privacy. And I think now, as you said, uh, maybe we'll get used to, uh, you know, everything we sign up on mobile, we, should, we, we will give out, give, give out the mobile phone numbers and for mm. registration. But maybe in the Western world, that's a big problem is why people give up the you know, mobile phone number. That's mm. really private stuff. But in China, mm. maybe you get it. And, and, but if you look at the other sides, I think kind of controversial is why you know, we think that, for example, like AI or 5G, they have a huge market in China because and also in China, I think the most people here, we are talking about applications. Why? Because you have to kind of uh, leverage the data privacy with the technology itself. Then you can think about the applications because if you look at the, maybe in the, in the Western, in Europe or, or States, they, they are more concerned about data. So you have to figure out you know, how to protect, protect data first, then they think about mm. the applications. Mm. So that kind of, uh, in some way, I think that's kind of delay mm. of the people of, of the, how the application, you know, development but, mm. but in China we we always think about okay um, maybe is uh, always applications so that's why I think maybe that's one of the reason the technology is growing faster and on the AI side and uh, in the AI sectors than mm. the rest of the world there we see so many applications and you know in you know in different industry in industry right now we talk about the application, we talk about the monetizations. And mm. instead of by investing, we still maybe we're more concerned on the research level. Mm. That's kind of stop the, mm. the AI, AI because we still worry, oh, how, how we can use AI for to make money. It's mm. happens of things. But in China, mm. the, you know, we have less concern on the privacy in some way, but maybe that's kind of a boost in mm. you know how people monetize the AI the technology or 5G technologies, yeah, yeah. I, I said I think it's um, it's, it's probably the philosophies. Um, I think it's I think maybe it's 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 time we need time to educate uh, the the Chinese and uh, also maybe for Chinese we need more think more over on the private side and maybe on the Western world is on the opposite is you mm. know how we can find the trade-off between the privacy and the applications. I think this is beautiful. And I remember um, the general attitude in China when I was just exploring this market, when I was 17 years old and I you know, landed in the mainland, it was like everything is allowed unless it's specifically prohibited. So usually you jump into this new idea, you go and implement, oh, the app or this new, again, technology, and then you figure out, okay, how do we actually uh, formalize it? How do we actually regulate it, et cetera? For example, just a few days ago, right, we've heard uh, how 300 plus live streaming studios, bloggers, uh, and apps were actually blocked and banned in China and, you know, outlawed in China. Just because, again, everything live streaming was hot and new. And right now the government says, okay, there needs to be some regulations. Otherwise, some illegal stuff is also happening, obviously, on these platforms. Yeah, right? I think that's how, I think it's probably, it's, it's hard to say, to give a judgment, say, oh, it's good or bad, but that's how the Chinese internet how the industry, kind of how that works. It's always, you know, it's the new, it's a new sector. It always, you see, is an open, basically you see the open sea. You can do everything mm. there. Mm. And 
but you know, at some point, you're going to see more and more regulation come in and to kind of regulate the whole the whole thing, and then the market getting more and more mature. And I think that's the, probably that's the difference, and you know, compared to China market and with the kind mm. of Western, is Western always come with uh, the the regulation first, and you know, mm. to think over it, then you see more application, but you see the time it delay. Mm. Um, Absolutely, absolutely. So we've covered very quickly telecom and the 5G and uh, cybersecurity. Let's move on to the other exciting part of Chinese very unique tech, which is the new retail and e-commerce. Everybody agrees that China is absolutely unmatched when it comes to the implementation of all this technology, AI, robots, um, also analytic systems within uh, you know, retail space and e-commerce space and what we call now the new retail. What's your take on that? What are you excited about? What do you th uh, think the future of this part is going to be? Yeah, I, I think I think for the retail or maybe the, the global, global world is like, you know, the e-commerce in, in general. I think still uh, there are huge market potential here. And it's because if you talk about e-commerce, and, um, you know, as, as for sure you know that is, Maybe years ago, everybody think because we have Alibaba, so, so some people said, you know, the e-commerce in China is done because, you know, Alibaba is so huge. Then suddenly we see like, uh, you know, the little red book and, you know, of course, the Pindo door, you see, oh, actually you see some new companies coming and they have their, they, they're getting huge. And also they, they find their kind of unique and, you know, market production and still they kind of, uh, they are competing with JD, competing with Alibaba. And, and I think if you look at the, in the next five ten, to 10 years, um, probably you're going to see more, maybe the, not that many, but for sure you're going to see more because if you look at China, you know, you, you know Alibaba is done the on, online side, but you know, mm. offline retail because the new technology, you know, you know AI or, or 5G, you're going to see more technology adopted by the offline and retail business. Um, and also, if you look at the China, because we had like tier one city, tier one, tier two city, maybe it's uh, dominated by JD or or Alibaba, but mm. you know, Pinduoduo is doing very well in the you know the tier three, maybe tier four, mm. and you know, you know, reminding us that we have a tier five, you know, <laughs> the countryside. There's still lots of uh, things, um, you know, still lots of market you know to do, and you're gonna see more kind of approach to do the e-commerce, you know, live streaming and, you know, the KOL, you see, you know, it's quite interesting that before everybody look at the jump on Taobao, it's like, it's mm. really, really centered, you know, platform or market, marketplace. But now because we have all the KOL, we have, you know, even the TikTok, you know, almost all the platform that are doing e-commerce, they have their own KOL, KOL basically sitting stuff, mm. then you know from center platform, you see more like a distributed platform because you can, you can buy anything from anywhere from anybody. Mm. And then with that, the, the, you know, so much potentials and, and there's so many more ideas you might be, might be explored um, by the startups. Absolutely. And I love it how dynamic this market as well is. As you said, right now, there's a huge merger between e-commerce platforms and social media platforms. So, for example, ByteDance, right? We all know Douyin. Um, they had traditionally been a social media platform, but right now they're literally blocking all of their third party uh, sites and links. And they are allowing you to only work with influencers through their official channel. They want to be the centerpiece. And they recently also applied for the financial uh, business license, right? So they, they now can provide financial services and payments and all that. So they are closing their bite dance loop, right? Through Douyin and later on they have Xigua, they have, uh, you know, all other so social media and news platforms to, you know, be a part of that loop, which is very interesting. What is your take on, uh, obviously, Alibaba is the biggest and the coolest. JD and Alibaba have very different business models. One, one is a retailer, the other one is a platform. What's your take on Pinduoduo? Because a lot of people, um, you know, view it as the challenger. You said, right, they, they accumulated huge numbers of followers and they are... Um, you know, kind of cool platform, but how much technology is really behind and how much of it is really purely driven by discounts and how sustainable is this business model? Because this year has been amazing for Pinduoduo. 
And what is your personal take on whether it is justified to be so successful and growing so fast? Yeah, I, th I think the, there are lots of uh, comments on Pinodo, and you know, is good or, or negative or positive. But, but maybe for me, maybe I can give you know, examples, my personal personal kind of experience. Um, so, so basically, I think to me is um, I'm using Pinodo, but what happened during the the pandemic uh, mm -hmm. in the past several months is 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 so interesting. Is my parents at age of around seventy. They never used e-commerce before, I mean, on the mobile phone. Everything they want to buy, they always they came to me and say, hey, can you buy this on Taobao <laughs> or JD or any other? But because pandemic, you know, they started using Pinduoduo. Mm. And, and, and right now is like every day, you know, I see delivery, delivery to my house like almost every day. But like my wife used to ask me, so, oh, did you buy this stuff? I said, no, I didn't buy anything. But then 10,000, all my parents, you know, <laughs> <laughs> my my previous production, and so so I think this you know I didn't use Pinduoduo that much. You know, in general, I don't use e-commerce that much. But then I realized is you know if you look at my parents' level, you know they are not really you know techy person. If they can use Pinduoduo, you know obviously you know, Pinduoduo you know give them very good experience for for that age group. The secondly, I think that age group they care about. The, the price, that's for sure. You know, they also care about the quality, you know, the, the, the quality and the quality as well, quality and the mm. quality as well. So if they keep buying, which means at least, you know, with that price, they're okay with the quality. And so I think, I think you see why, so I was asking myself why they didn't buy anything that much on Taobao or JD. So at least you can tell you Pinduoduo, you know, did something very well and also differently to kind of uh, to please uh, that group of people. And mm -hmm. I think that, that's the first thing. You know, the secondly, I think how the Pinduoduo run the business is, for example, you never buy kind of fruit on Taobao before, but now you can mm -hmm. buy that on Pinduoduo and with good and the cheap price. And so, and also if you go to the, you know, you know tier three, tier four cities, and you see the more and more people using Pindu as well. So, and also, if you know, if you don't stand on the consumer and side, but if you look at on the uh, merchandise size, actually the Pindu have a lot of uh, you know farmers and you know to sell their mm. uh, stuff and to China, maybe to the world. I think that brings lots of values to the society as well. But of course, mm. uh, on the size. You know, uh, you know, we talk about the, the qualities, um, you know, or some fake stuff. Um, I think is uh, we have to um, admit that. I think still you, you might find some still you might find some stuff on, on Pinduoduo. Maybe it uh, look like the genuine one, but actually it's not. But I think to me, as a kind of technology person, I think everything you know, Pinduoduo have four years, five years old. Yeah. We need to give them times. Um, yeah, yeah, that's my, that's kind of my very take. interesting take and thank you for sharing. Okay, let's move on to the next part, which is mobility and smart cities. Of course, they cannot be disconnected. So basically, what is the future of mobility as you see it in China being built in China right now? Uh, we have a couple of phenomenal cities like Shenzhen, where everything is electric, where you know, um, there are very hardcore goals that the government together with the uh, tech giants are setting up for uh, operating the city. Uh, how do you see the future of mobility in China and interconnected kind of smart city? Yeah, I think, the, yeah, as I said, I think the, the mobility or smart city, I think it's, uh, I think the, the key driver, it has, has to be the government. Mm. So I think it's, so that's why if you look at the kind of smart city or even the, uh, the, the EV industry in China, I think the, chi the Chinese government have a huge impact uh, into these sectors because this, these sectors that require lots of the capitals and also regulations. I think this is all from all needs the government effort. So as, as I mentioned, I think if you look at you know the the Shenzhen and Shang, Shang, you know Shanghai or Beijing, and you see almost every day the government talk about the you know smart cities, uh, talk mm. about UVs all day, 
I think they, they want to kind of push the whole industry forward. Uh, even we see, still see so much you know, concern, uh, as I mentioned, like the privacy, of course, and, and also because the, like the EVs is really disrupt the, the older industry uh, as well. Um, so I think, I think especially on the EV side, um, you know, Tesla, Tesla here, but we, we also see right now we have at least three EV companies, you know, the, the way like the new Xiaopong, mm, mm. Um, the, the other one, I think they all went to, they are all listed company right now. Mm. Uh, and also behind them, they always see the, you know, you see the big giant like Tencent or Alibaba, they are like, mm. they are in they also probably you see the government as an investor so you can see the whole industry is uh, you know spend lots of money to drive this forward and I think there's no reason uh, you say okay one day this company going to fail I think they have to they have to succeed uh, you know <laughs> because, because we, failure you know, is not we, an option <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that's true and I think the because the EV is uh, the big part in the smart city systems so I think uh, on the government side, um, you see the, I think they also invested, I uh, also the whole, the venture capital in China also invested lots of uh, um, related the technology company, the, the auto driven company, the, to- the technology and the laser, all the stuff. So um, I think, but still, I think you still need time. I don't know, mm. maybe 10 years or more to, for the consumers and to really kind of enjoy the smart city or UV. Mm. Um, uh, but uh, I think, you know, uh, but I think now, w- w- I think, I think because we, we talk to the AI companies, like since times, I think even uh, since times, probably the number one validated company in China, AI company in mm. China, we talk to the, the, the CXO level, they're going to mm. tell you, Still need times, and also it's not like you know two years, three years. Still mm. need like long time to. So, dri- so how far off do you feel the driverless vehicles are? Uh, you know, from major Chinese cities. Wow. Five to ten. <laughs> Fifteen. I think at least five to ten because it's a it's a systems. It's not just about the EVs, right? Of it's course. just about Tesla. Everything is you know settled. Is always to do with you know the city cameras, CCTV, the the smart city systems, the regulations is is a mm. huge systems, not mm. just about one you know, the car. And there are so many, as you mentioned, Chinese local players that are in this field right now. Uh, traditionally, there are obviously the car um, and the automobile industry is very Western uh, dominated. You know, German businesses, a couple of American players here and there. But what is your take for going forward? Do you think that local players, Chinese players, are going to be dominating the game? Uh, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> I think are they going to share? <laughs> well, I, I think the, I think the short term. I mean, I think because if you look at in China. Is actually the, there are three I, I would say like three group of uh, players, like the new players, like new the other kind of new players. We also have uh, kind of uh, foreigners like a Tesla, right, mm. and also BMW and all these kind of traditional um, the, the the players. And also we have the domestic uh, car manufacturers like BYD, BRD, mm. or you know, others. They are also very strong uh, as well. So who's going to win? I don't know, but I think the China market is a huge uh, market for the EV. So I think they're going to share the market. Um, it's hard to see who's going to be the winner. Uh, I think right now maybe Tesla is uh, doing very well in selling. And but if you look at the if you look at in that, in the industry, I think BYD is uh, they have a huge resource in China. Um, they, they don't really bring everything yet. They, you know, still they're still trying uh, in some like uh, vertical sectors. But maybe one day when they are fully ready, maybe you're going to see a big change there. And mm. for the new players like Xiaobong or, or new, I think the, the young generation love it. 
because they are they, they know how to do the marketing you know to the young generation uh, they, they they know how to kind of educate the new concept you know the concept and how to make it fun and you know how to pitch the young generations maybe you know the nature maybe they're going to be big and so it's hard to say now Mm, perfect. Let's move on to the next topic. And you just now spoke about marketing and uh, um, appealing to younger audiences. So let's talk about entertainment and content, essentially. So many cool things are happening in China tech space. I mean, we're watching TV and we have holographic projections on the TV. We can interact, do O to O. I mean, there is this, again, uh, holograms basically being beamed at you in a restaurant to showcase somebody dancing and promoting hot pot. Like, like very, very cool stuff when it comes to entertainment, gaming, um, uh, shows, live streaming, blah, blah, blah. What is your take uh, for this sector? What do you see are the most important kind of technologies or themes? And how is it going to look a couple of years from now? On the entertainment side? Um, I, I, well, I don't know. First of all, maybe I, I already passed the age of entertainment. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but Never too I, late. I, <laughs> yeah okay i wish but anyway i think it's um if you look at the um, um the how the young generation or well what's the word um like the people you know millennials born, yeah yes so how it plays is really beyond kind of my my mind because you know how they how they plays how they use the technologies and how they kind of play their virtual the identities in different platform is it's just amazing it's uh it's really blow my mind i, I think I, I would say you know what i can imagine with my knowledge is i, I think for the the young generation or next generation of the young generation um i think they're going to meet more and more adopt into the the virtual world um if that's going to happen i think it's uh, with also 5g and I think maybe the VR or AR will, will play a big part in their daily life. You know, I think that will be kind of, uh, their uh, kind of a portal um, to, in, you know, to bring the virtual world to be truly engaged with the realities. I, I, think, I think, you know, in the, in the, if you look at the virtual world, maybe everything will be repeated again. The how to buy stuff on the virtual world, and uh, you have another identity, and uh, you have a, another mm -hmm. bunch of virtual goods you can buy, and uh, maybe some virtual goods could be become reality as well. Uh, you know, they could be very, you know, very much fun uh, there, but and uh, I don't know, but it's uh, yes, yeah, it could be a virtual world, I guess. Uh, it very much reminds me of the uh, movie Ready Player One, where, you yeah. know, they were in the game and essentially there was this dual reality, right? And we are truly getting a bit closer uh, to that. Do you believe that we are going to have, uh, with 5G, a lot of people say that 5G is a step be, uh, obviously between where we are right now and what is the future going to look like. They, everybody says that 6G is going to project holograms onto the streets. Uh, and that would be really, really cool. So maybe just in a couple of years, we're going to have 6G reality and merger between this online world and the uh, real kind of world, which is very cool. Uh, yeah, um, maybe 5G is not ready yet. Or maybe 5G is not the, you know, the didn't bring that package. But I think 5G, 6G will. 6G yeah. likely will, yeah. And mm -hmm. China government has already started developing 6G, if I'm not mistaken. Already last year, they started trying with a couple of companies. Obviously, it's going to take them a few years, but uh, that's interesting, right? Yeah, yeah. I think the 6G, probably that's about something. Hopefully, we can still see that. But 5G definitely will be the tipping point and will change our mindset, you know, how, the, how we can kind of uh, mix the reality with the, mm. the virtual world. Yeah. Right now, you just uh, quickly mentioned, uh, I hope that we're going to see it. So you believe that 6G technology is going to take a lot of years to develop? What is your take? Oh, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know. I think it, at least it's, um, you know, maybe it took us, I don't know, maybe five to 10 years to fully adopt. It. I think it's always, uh, maybe for, for 5Gs, I, I would say is, uh, we, we should see it like, the next times. 
So if mm. you say 4G is uh, take to cost 10 years, 5G probably five, you know maybe five years, 6G maybe even shorter, because the technology always the window for adoption of technology is getting shorter and shorter. So right, it's just an upward curve. That's beautiful. Let's move on to the next topic, um, blockchain and currency and payments and all that stuff that's happening right now in the world. China has recently introduced its uh, digital currency. In fact, it has promised us this fully digital RMB already a few years ago. And right now the trials are underway for some selected individuals. What is your take on this whole blockchain technology when it's linked with, um, with digital currency of a country? Well, first of all, I have to say, um, the people call me, I don't know if you know, the, uh, people call me, uh, I'm the classic internet expert. Uh, <laughs> which means because, you know, how in China say, okay, if you, are, if you don't touch blockchain, you are a classic internet person. Uh, unfortunately, I'm the classic one. So I don't have that much of a knowledge on, the, on blockchain. But the only thing I can say is, uh, um, you know, if, you know, even we just talked about the 5G or the virtual world, is I think that the currency will go, will be go virtual. That's, I think that's to do with the blockchain. But of course, uh, I would say probably I'm not interested in the, in the, the, the currencies itself, but I'm more interested in on the, the blockchain technologies. Yeah, I think mm. to, me, it's, to me, it's more like infra infrastructure, like 5G at the infrastructure. Mm. Uh, or, or the like the payment infrastructure built by Ali, you know, you know, Alipay or WeChat payment. I think blockchain, mm. blockchain bus infrastructure. Um, then you can see the more applications. Maybe the virtual currency will be one of the applications on top of the mm. blockchain, and um, that's going to change how we play the currencies on the virtual on the virtual world. Um, I think uh, you know that's pretty much the, the comments I can give. And for, for now, is um, I think the host of knowledge is I, I need to digest as well. It's just too much happening on the, on the blockchain side. Absolutely. But I love your analogy with blockchain being the infrastructure for a lot of different things happening from logistics to, as you said, currency to, you know, building the whole, again, smart cities, et cetera, et cetera, you know, having the security and codes. Um, one of the last questions would be really about this current situation between the US and China. There's a huge tech war going on and media war going on. And a lot of people are seeing this as essentially polarization of the two systems, right? When we talk about technology and uh, internet, right? They're not developing together. They are truly becoming parallel universes. What is your take on what's happening right now? Is the decoupling of the systems possible? Is this a viable future? And essentially, where are we going to find ourselves um, in a couple of, uh, again, uh, months or years from now? Well, I think it's at least to me is I don't I don't really want that happen. But mm. I think the reality is probably going to see the the decoupling is uh, probably getting worse and worse. And you know, I'm feeling in next maybe at least one or two years. Um, and, and so so you're going to see and the only is you know we only talk about the the technology side. Uh, probably you're going to see two kind of two ecosystems mm. um, they are separate now and um, it's more like it's like 10 years ago you know no matter we're talking about like copy you know copycat or copy to china blah, blah, blah. at least you see the the collection between china and and states is uh, you know they are kind of bundled and together there are so much um, you know good things even a bad thing happen but you see like they do that together and you know somehow mm. but now it's, it's like if you look at all, you know, most of the Chinese unicorns in China, um, you know, their business is you, you couldn't, you couldn't find any kind of benchmark from Silicon Valley anymore. Is they all started, mm. or the major business is always in China. And it's also the China unique. And mm. so you're going to see two ecosystems. Um, but, but I think it's, Probably you see decoupling between China and, and, and states, but maybe because of that, and what we see here is that drive China is getting more closer to APEC or, mm. or especially Southeast Asia. 
um, maybe because of culture, and mm. so that's why, uh, as we, we mentioned, in Southeast Asia, you see more and more copy from China, and uh, you see the Chinese unicorn, Chinese you know, um, uh, capitals, and they start investing lots of money or effort into the uh, Southeast Asia. Um, so, and, you know, so I don't know, hopefully, I mean, to me, is 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 kind of sad you see the decoupling and the decoupling happen mm. know, happening right now but but if you look at the productive size is um i think china the the collection or coupling between china and south asia or or apac and probably gonna see more um mm. that could be thing as well but still um I, I think for chinese company i think the most of the Chinese big companies, they are suffering. Mm. And, you know, even like Huawei, I think everybody's suffering and because mm. of the sales. Um, but the, the, the positive size, but which kind of drive everybody here in China to look at another directions. And, you know, the, for example, for Huawei, they used to, the, because the, they always work with Google, with Android, they, they mm. don't need uh, they don't need to worry about the ecosystems and build mm. around the hardware. But because the the situation, they, they push them, okay, they have to care about the how to build their own ecosystems. Mm. Not in states, but they have to do that in South Asia, in APAC. Um, so that could be the potential market as well. And probably maybe even one day is uh, even, um, you see even huge or more potentials uh, as well so coming out of it absolutely and for, for china right now it's not only southeast asia as you mentioned the very close partner but also look at the africa right where there are already a lot of ties with the local um you know governments and countries and entrepreneurs like jack ma has his huge entrepreneurial fund in africa and looking at Southeast um, Asia, we mentioned, but also uh, South America, right? So there are those countries that are essentially looking for for some opportunities. Or Russia, another country uh, in between, you know, Asia and Europe that is uh, very much being influenced by Chinese tech. So these are all can be viewed as opportunities. Gang, yeah. thank you so much for sharing your uh, insights and knowledge. And uh, it was very, very meaningful and very useful. Um, guys, stay tuned for more China experts to come soon. And uh, Gang, we're going to continue observing what's happening in the China tech space. It's definitely the most dynamic and exciting space out there right now. And uh, let's build that common joint and better future together.